what is the right way to measure impedance with this thing? Well, as with any good technical question, the answer is, it depends. Hello, and welcome back. Today, I want to look at some of the setup considerations that need to be taken into account when measuring impedance with a vector network analyzer. For my experiments, I will be using a light VNA, but the same principles do apply regardless of equipment. Just because a piece of kit is expensive will not make it perform better if it is not used correctly. So I will be looking at the various ways in which a VNA can be connected to perform measurements, but also what sort of setup considerations need to be taken to get the best and well, the correct results. So first things first, your basic two-port vector network analyzer can measure two of the S parameters characteristic to a device under test, the S11 and the S21 parameters. The first refers to how much of an incident wave gets reflected back, and the second refers to how much of a wave passes through to the second port. Now, although you will see that the results can be all sorts of other parameters, like impedance, inductance, gain, and all sorts of other things, the actual values are all derived through various calculations from the base 2 S parameters. Point is that for any result, you don't need to save the exact results value, but just the S parameters. So coming back to measuring impedance, there are three main ways that this can be done using a VNA. You have the reflection or shunt method, where you're using just a single port, and then you have the two port measurements, where the tested circuit is either shunted in between the signal line and the ground, the shunt through setup, or the test component is placed in series in between the two ports, the series through setup. Now, although all three of these methods work, the best method for your particular needs is however dependent on the exact impedance of the tested component. So starting from the port impedance, 50 ohm for most equipment, the impedance range, higher and lower, can be divided into three main regions. First, for values relatively close to 50 ohms, so the 5 to 500 ohm range, these are best covered by the single port reflection method. So if you want to measure your antenna or a transmission line or an amplifier port, all of which should be in this sort of range, then the single port reflection method is the best. The next range, say low values, equal to or lower than 50 ohms, are best covered by the shunt through method. So this technique, will give good results even going down into the milliohm range. And it's commonly used when analyzing low impedance structures, like power distribution networks or decouplings for various circuit boards. And finally, values larger than 50 ohms are best covered by the series through method. If you want to measure things like chokes, common mode transformers, or just large impedance components, this third method will give the best results. Now, although any method will be able to measure any value, the smallest tolerances in the results are obtained when sticking to these three separate ranges. Last thing to mention before moving on is the exact method to convert the S parameter to an impedance. So for each of the three methods, there is a different calculation that needs to be applied. And the thing to remember here is that even if the measurement equipment does not have the built-in capability to display the test circuit's parameters in your preferred way of expression, you can always do the math yourself through a spreadsheet program, and from there obtain the final desired results. So for example, I used my light VNA in conjunction with the nano VNA saver program to perform a measurement, and although this has certain S21 parameter related value expressions, it can't for example tell me the inductance value when measuring using the shunt through method. It's always some combined parameter or something else. So to obtain the desired value, I had to do it myself. For that, I first save the touchstone file, which I can open up in Notepad, and from here copy all of these values and place them into a spreadsheet program. Here, from all of these, I can extract the S21 parameter, so using the appropriate function, and from this, go through the various calculations. So first of all, extract the complex impedance, and then process this further either to extract the imaginary and real parts, or to perform some other more complex calculation. So you can make your own spreadsheet, or probably find better ones with built-in macro functions to automate this process. But I just did it this way since I found it easiest. Finally, all of the data that you end up obtaining can be displayed as a graph 
with the desired scale and formatting. So in my case I used logarithmic formatting for the frequency axis and linear for the resistance and reactance. Now in this particular case I use the light VNA to measure a 33 milliohm resistor using the Shunfru method and got surprisingly good results. So although the measurement result is noisy, so the orange one is the resistance, the value is extremely close to the 33 milliohm point. Now, one final observation about the touchstone files. These are saved using a standardized format. So any VNA, whether it's your $100 nano VNA or the $10,000 premium equipment, they will all use the same standardized data. So this type of data processing with a spreadsheet or something else can use any sort of input source. Now, based on the exact impedance value, we could choose one measurement method or another. But what else should you be looking for to get good results? Well, as with any measurement, there are some details to keep in mind. The first most basic measure to ensure reliable and repeatable measurement results is to turn on the test setup and let it warm up. So this is not always important, of course. If you just want to make a basic measurement, it will not really matter. But when the actual accuracy is critical, it's important to let the measurement equipment stabilize itself before beginning to use. Commonly, 10 to 30 minutes should be sufficient. The other thing to consider is environmental noise, especially when trying to measure very small values or when working with very high impedances. Limiting external noise can be done in multiple ways. You can move the setup further away from noisy equipment. You can place the measurement setup in a small shielded enclosure. And final thing to consider is the equipment's cable connections, particularly for the nano VNA connected to a PC. One measure that can sometimes help is adding ferrites to the USB cable to limit conducted noise. Now, when making a more in-depth analysis, the first thing to remember is that any cable has impedance. So current passing through it will always create a voltage drop. Specifically, in the case of the Shunfru method, one important consideration needs to be taken when making low frequency measurements. With this method, the current that passes through the test circuit should ideally go back through the injection cables. And while the second port should only read the voltage drop occurring on the load. In reality, since the same ground is common for both ports, part of the current will go through the second cable as well, creating a voltage shift in the result. The solution to this is to somehow break the ground loop. However, this problem will only exist at relatively low frequency, so below say a few megahertz. Since above, the loop impedance is too high for any current to, well, take the scenic route. Now, although multiple solutions exist to this problem, two common measures are to first of all move the test circuit as close as possible to the first port, so the injection cable's impedance is as small as possible, and the second measure is to add a common mode choke to suppress any current that is not part of the differential measurement. So this choke should only be on the second port's line. Last thing to mention about these methods is that you'll have to redo all of your calibrations if anything in a setup changes. So to try and put everything into practice, I went ahead and measured the coil over a wide frequency range. And since the frequency and thus impedance varies over a wide interval, I put all of the measurement techniques into use. Regarding all of the other observations, I first let the VNA warm up for more than 10 minutes, I used a ferrite on the USB cable, and I also added a common mode choke on the second port line. So hopefully, this will lead to a decently clean result. So I took this small inductor, and all of the measurements were done from the 50 kHz to 100 MHz range using 20,000 points. Then I took all of the S-parameter data into a spreadsheet to process it. So to first of all extract the complex S-parameter, from this determine the complex impedance, and from that to determine the absolute impedance and the inductance. So this was done for all three methods. So first of all looking at the impedance from the three measurements, so here we have in blue the single port measurement, orange the shunt through, and in gray the series through, we can already see that we are getting completely different results with the three measurements. So specifically looking in the low impedance range, we can already see that the series through method can't really measure anything below 100 ohms. So this is definitely not correct in this area. 
and well, for the other two methods, they seem to be giving more or less the same result below 10 ohms. So at least from the impedance measurement, it's not very clear that there's a difference between the shunt through method or the single port method. Now, looking to the other extreme, to high impedances, we can see that we are getting three different resonance frequencies, but the other thing to observe is just how noisy the measurement is. So the noisiest measurement is the shunt through method, whereas the least noisy measurement is the series through method. So this is indicating to us that this is the cleanest measurement, most likely giving us the correct values. Now, since the component that I was measuring was an inductor, I also extracted the inductance value from the free methods. So we can see that all of the free methods are giving us a value close to free microhenry. So this is 3.2 microhenry, 3.0 microhenry. But again, we can see that there's a difference in between the measurements. So at very low frequency, the series through method is giving this hump. So this is definitely not correct. We are seeing a hump, at least at very low frequency, even with the single port measurement but the shunt through measurement is the only one that is giving a more or less flat response. So at low impedances, at low frequencies, this is more accurate. Now, to finally get a single graph from this thing, I extracted the values from each measurement in a specific range. So at very low frequency, I took the values from the shunt through method, at well, average values, I took the single port result, and then at high frequency, I took the results from the series through method. And while combining all three, we are getting a very nice, almost straight graph. Since the inductor's impedance covers quite a few decades of range, this sort of combination of results will sometimes be necessary to get a correct result over a wide frequency range. So here we can see that our inductor is more or less at 3.2 microhenries before its resonance frequency. Last thing I want to mention today is the exact test signal level. So the VNA works by injecting a test signal into the measured device and observing how the signal is impacted. To get the best noise immunity and clear results in extreme cases, you want the injection signal to be as large as possible. So the larger the voltage, the more clear the result should be. However, the exact voltage level to which the device is exposed can cause a detrimental effect on the observed result. So the larger the test signal is, the larger the applied voltage. And depending on the test circuit, the behavior can be non-linear. So if we wish to measure the parallel capacitance of a Schottky type of diode, which has a forward voltage somewhere in the 0.2 volt region, applying a 0 dBm signal will clearly end up forward biasing the circuit and giving us erroneous results. Similar behavior can be obtained with things like amplifiers or even magnetic cores driven into saturation. The solution to this problem is to change the injected signal level. If the possibility is available, then this should be done from the VNA itself, or if not, then you will need to add external attenuators. Of course, smaller signal levels will give more noisy results, but at least they will be the correct results. Now, as an example for another video, I measured this small signal amplifier on its input side, once with an attenuator and once without. First, I looked at the gain of the amplifier. So I always use an attenuator, but once I put it before the amplifier and once after. The total gain of the system should have been identical in both cases. However, looking at the measurement results, they were completely different. When the attenuator was at the front, I was getting the expected 20 decibels result. Whereas with the attenuator after the amplifier, I was getting about 15 and some measurement glitches. So definitely this second measurement was not giving the expected results. The other thing I looked at was the input port's impedance. So first of all, with a direct measurement and then measured through a attenuator. So in both cases, the impedance that I would have wanted to get was around 50 ohms. But in my first case, I was getting somewhere in the 130 ohm region, so more than double what I was expecting. Whereas in my second case, I was getting values far closer to the expected value, but the measurement was far more noisy. So when performing measurements with smaller signals, it won't be ideal, but it can become necessary. In the end, 
the VNA, just like any other piece of equipment, is only a good tool if you know how to use it. It has its limitations and its problems, but understanding them and taking the necessary precautions will allow you to get better results. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you can check out. And if you want to be up to date with all my latest videos, you can also consider subscribing. And well, see you next time. Bye bye.